God bless you, dear viewer. Thank you so much for tuning in to our Q&A. My name is Kenny Affer. Come to you right now from the altar of the River of Light Fellowship, Nairobi, Donham, Kenya. And I'm so glad that you're able to tune us in so that we can be able to talk together. I'm sure God has something in store for us. I want to continue to encourage you to uh, send your questions. Even while you're alive, it's possible, of course, for us to interact with you. Um, on certain questions in case you'd actually want to drop in some questions. This is our Q&A service that we bring to you live every Saturday, and um, this is the time for it. And so I pray that you can be willing to invite somebody at this moment because whatever we're going to touch, I'm sure it's going to touch on everybody's life. And so I pray that God helps you to get a friend that you truly love, uh, that pressure part of this service that we're going to have. My name is Ken Yaffa, for you who have probably not, never known my name. I'm coming to talk to us about Q&A. So I want to talk to us, the question, the first question that we have is about faith. And um, the person that is asking the question is asking this very significant question, how can I get rid of doubt? How can I get rid of doubt? Doubt is actually one plague that a lot of people struggle with. And several times, we do not know how to handle it. You know, we almost like literally raised to doubt. We, we, right from birth, we are people that are raised to doubt, fed on toxic information, stuff like that. And, and so because of that, therefore, we are wired up to doubt. And so by the time that we're giving our life to the Lord and we want to live for God, several times doubt was already established before faith came in. And so the question is, how can I get rid of this doubt? And that's really why I'm sitting here. And I pray that God is going to help us to see it surgically and to see the depth of the whole thing. Now, the first thing about doubt that is so important, that if you truly want to get rid of doubt, must happen, is you must know the significance of faith. You must know the significance of faith. That really is important. You will never be willing to pay a price for something whose value you do not know. And you must understand, of course, that as I'm going to, ex to, to get deeper into it, that doubt is a weed that chokes the seed of faith. I want you to get that in your spirit. Doubt is always a weed that chokes the, the, the seed of faith. And so if you truly understand that, then you want to make sure that you get rid of the weed. Now, you can't get rid of the weed if you really don't value the crop that the weed is trying to choke. And that's why then it becomes important that you actually understand the power of faith. Why do you need faith? What is the significance of faith? That's the first thing. You must come to the place where you truly understand the value, the significance of faith. Now, one of the things that we talked about when we're dealing with the subject on faith, and I don't want to go back there because this is recorded. You can go to our Facebook page and you can be able to look at some of the things that we talked about faith over a long period of time. So I don't want to go back there. Is that faith is the only currency that we use to pay for the divine. That is something that I said quite categorically, unapologetically. And I pray that you can be able to fall back on that. Faith is the only currency that you pay with when you're interested in the divine. Now, you never understand that until you have needed the divine. See, the problem with humanity is that when man sins, man continued to live even though God told him that when he eats of the tree that God had forbidden, he would die. When you look at the book of Genesis chapter number 3, after man had eaten of the forbidden fruit, he still lived on. And so, and so man cannot understand how this death plays out because God said that when you eat of it, you will die. But here you are, you're actually moving on. And the reason is simple, that man lost the life that God gave to him. He lost the divine life of God. Man lost the divine life of God and man acquired a fallen life. And that is an amazing thing that is so important to understand because from that moment, man fell to a platform of human solution and man came away from the platform of the divine. But as we live on, you will always come to a place in your life when you will need the divine.
And the only instrument, the only currency you must pay with for the divine is faith. So the moment that becomes apparent, it becomes so important to you. And so faith then becomes very valuable asset that you can't do without. And that is what makes you then want to deal with doubt. You can't deal with the weed that chokes the wheat if you don't have value for the wheat. You can't deal with the, 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 the doubt that chokes the faith if you really don't have value for faith. So my point is simple. Whoever you are, no matter how great you are, no matter how important you are, no matter how much you've written through the ranks of life, oh, I pray you understand it, beloved. No matter how much you've risen through the ranks of life, no matter how educated, no matter what achievements you have in this life, there will be a moment in your life you will need the divine. There will be a moment in your life when your natural fallen human life has no power to take a stand against what is confronting you. And you will need the divine life of God. There will be a moment that you will need God to give you life. Not the life your father and your mother gave you. Not the life your family gave you. Not the life the society gave you. But the life that can only be given to you by God. You, you really don't understand that until you look at uh, the King Ezekiah. In the book of Isaiah chapter number 38 recorded there. King Ezekiah got to the place where the Bible said that the man was sick. And the prophet of God was sent by the Lord to come and inform him that he was going to die. And so when the prophet came, the prophet told him, you are actually going to die. Put your house in order. That is the moment that you actually realize how significant the divine is. Because suddenly, the life he had always enjoyed as a king, the fallen human life that his father and mother had given to him, now has no power to deal with what confronts him. So he needs something from the hand of the Lord. And the Bible says that when he was told that, that he broke down and he began to cry. He was crying in desperation. It is possible that as a king, he had not cried for a long time. But suddenly he's confronted by something that he knows without God coming in, without the divine coming in, he is completely in a fix. And he can't be able to make it through. He's surely going to die if God does not come in. And that's what I'm talking about. And the Bible says that the man cried out to God. He cried to God. And God Almighty. And he recovered from that sickness. By the divine power of God. And he was given more years. And in the years that he was given. Actually that's when he gave birth. He brought forth his son Manasseh. That became the heir of the throne. It's something so powerful. Because there was still the balance of purpose. That his life carried. That was, was yet to be fulfilled. And so if he died at that moment, it would actually have made the jeopardy of the purpose that he carried. There was no heir to actually handle the throne after him because he had never given or brought forth a son. So now death was going to capture him, destroy him before he gives, brings forth a son. That, that is how important it is when you actually think of the divine. That there will be a moment that the natural human strength that you rely on can fail. And you need the divine. And when you come to that place where you need the divine power of God, the divine life of God. Then the reality, beloved, is that the divine can only be accessed and purchased by faith. So if you don't have faith, then that's the moment that it is over. It, you, you, you will come to a place, no matter who you are, that you will need divine help. Right now, as I'm talking to you, I'm speaking in the middle of a crisis that the whole world is going through. It's a pandemic of a plague that has captured all the nations of the earth. Every media house talks about corona at this time. And it is something that has shaken this world right to the core. And the human body is at stake. We, we try to do everything we can. We, we are given all of the kind of 
uh, precautionary measures by the government and, and the medical facilities and the professionals and we really appreciate every the work that they're putting into it every work that the government is putting in place the government is a pa parental body over the nation and so because of that therefore the government has responsibility to make sure that everybody is protected the government is has responsibility to make sure that nobody dies out of a pandemic like this and so all of the measures that we are asked to put in place are very important and everybody needs to make sure that you carry them out is extremely important but there are people that have carried out all of the human measures and they still got infected and some of them still dying so my point is simple my point is simple we are at a time when all of us need the divine power of God all of us need the divine we need God to reach out to us and and deposit something upon you that no human measure can cause I want you to think like this beloved I want you to think like this if they discover a vaccine and they inject your body with a vaccine, then suddenly your body develops the antibodies and suddenly you find you have immunity that is too strong for this virus. What if God Almighty did something divinely upon your body that cost your body's divine strength? What would that mean to you? Now you see, I'm talking against the prom. I'm talking on the platform of promises that God has given. When you look in the scripture, God has given promises that he cannot not lie on. God cannot lie. If you look at the book of Exodus chapter number 23, God spoke a promise that he gave to the people of Israel, but Israel was a type of the church. And so whatever promise that God gave to them is fulfilled in the church. In fact, that's what you see if you look at the book of 1 Corinthians 10 and verse number 11. He says, whatever promises that God gave, that they are fulfilled in us. We are the fulfillment of all of the promises that God has ever given. And in 2 Corinthians 1, verse number 20 to 21, the Bible says that whatever promises God ever gave, they are yes in Christ Jesus. And so when God spoke to the Israelite and he told them, that he will take away sickness from them. God was saying that I, the Lord God Almighty, have the ability to come upon you and take away sickness from you. And God went a little farther in the book of Deuteronomy 7, in verse number 15, he said, I will keep you from every disease you knew in Egypt. God is saying that I, the Lord, have interest in your health, and I want to keep you free from disease. I want to empower your body and bring you to a place where your body can actually be free from disease. God said that it can do that. And God says that it's willing to do that. One of the most amazing scriptures in the Bible is in the book of Numbers, chapter number 21. And but number four to eight, the Bible talks about how the Israelites, you know, grumbled against Moses and against God. And God sent a plague. God sent a plague. Just like right now, humanity is struggling with a plague. God sent the plague of snakes and the ven venomous snakes bit the Israelites and they died by their thousands. And the scripture said that when they realized this is overwhelming them, they decided to cry out to Moses and they asked Moses to cry out to God to remove the, the snakes. The snake was actually the, the source of the venom that was killing them. So they wanted the source of the venom to be removed. And God said, I'm not going to remove the source of the venom. And God told Moses, I wanted to build a snake. Put up a snake, a, an artificial man-made snake. Put it up on a pole. And Moses built a bronze snake. Put it up on a pole. And God said, whoever is bitten, if he looks up to the pole by faith, if in faith he looks up to the, the, the snake on the pole, he will just live. And that's exactly what happened. So you find people that have been bitten. A son that has been bitten by the same snake that killed his father yesterday. And today he's been bitten. The same venom is in his bloodstream. The same venom that killed his father is upon his body. But now because he's by faith looked at the brown snake, through the faith he's just living on. His body has acquired a divine state of being. There is something powerful God has done upon him through faith that now the venom that killed his father 
has no power over. And I want you to imagine, I want you to think, what would it be like if actually God kept you free from every disease? What would it be like if God Almighty brought you to the place where because of faith, your body is not susceptible to the things that are happening, not by the power of a vaccine, but by the power of divine vaccine. That God Almighty has just caused something in my body that makes my body be able to repel and destroy every kind of infection that would seek to come against it. That is what we see in the Bible. The book of Mark chapter number 16, and Jesus confronted us with something that is so interesting. He said, these signs will accompany them that believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. And then he went on and said, well, they will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. We have done that over and over again. But Jesus went a little farther. And he said that when you drink deadly poison, it's not accidentally eating food poison, food, food that is poison. It is drinking deadly poison. Please understand. I know there are preachers who have told people to drink poison. That is all stupidity. God does not want us to put him to the test. Jesus said, you shall not put the Lord thy God to the test. And so he did not say, look for poison, put it in a bottle and drink it. That is, that is not faith. That is foolishness. That is foolishness. So, but he said it, that when you drink it, if it so happens that you've drunk it, that you will be because of faith in me. Your body will be set up in such a way that it will not harm you at all. That is the principle that I want you to see there. And that's the same thing that Paul gets to pull through in the book of Romans 8, verse number 11. When he says is that if the spirit of him that raised Christ from the dead lives in you, he will also give life to your mortal body. So Paul gets to confront us with a reality that the spirit of God not only wants to empower our spirit, but the spirit of God wants to give life to the mortal body. The spirit of God wants to empower your mortal body. He wants to quicken the mortal body. That is the divine we are talking about, beloved. And what I'm making you understand here is that that. No matter who you are, no matter how powerful, no matter how great, there will be a moment you will need the divine. And there's never been a time that humanity needed divine health like we do today. We will always need divine security. There will be a moment when your own human security has no power. We have seen people assassinated that had all the greatest security details. We have seen people murdered that had the best security details. Even presidents have been killed before when they had so much of state security around them, but they were still killed. There is a place where human security measures don't have the ability to protect us, and we need the divine security of God. Am I in any way saying that it is wrong to have human security? That would be foolish of me. There is the responsibility that we have, all of us, that we must put in place. But when we put in place all of the human measures, we must come to the place that we understand that there will be a moment you will need the divine security of God Almighty. We see that recorded in the Bible over and over again. A man called Job. Job was a man that was hanged up by the Lord God Almighty. And the Bible says that, that Satan spoke to God said, Have you not built a hedge around Job? You built a hedge around it. There's a divine hedge around it. In 2 Kings chapter number 6, we see Elisha the prophet surrounded by chariots of fire from heaven. So an army that has been set and sent up by the king of Aram has no access to Elijah the prophet because the heavenly army surrounds him. And we've seen over and over again in the Bible, people that enjoy divine security by God Almighty and you live in a chaotic world where dangers lock everywhere and you need divine security there will be a moment in your life when you will need the divine my point is simple beloved for you to access this divine faith is the only currency that you will have to pay with and so the question we're asking then is what is the value of faith because it is not until you value faith that you actually 
channel all of your strength against doubt. Why? Because doubt is the weed that seeks to choke the seed of faith. So the moment you understand that doubt is actually a weed that comes to destroy the seed of faith in your life, and you understand how valuable faith is to you, then you're willing to take on the doubt and begin to fight it. Why? Because it's tampering with the seed of faith that is so important to me because it's the only currency that I pay with to access the divine. I pray you again. And as long as you live here, you will need the divine. You will need to come to a place where you have the divine power of God to make wealth. The Bible said that God raises the poor from the dust. You will need God to raise you from the dust. There will be a moment in your life you will need God to stretch his hand and raise you up from the place of stagnation, the place where you are stuck, the place where you're overwhelmed by the power of poverty. There will be that moment in your life. There will be a moment that you will need the divine. There will be a moment that you will need the divine power of God, the divine authority of God, the divine dominion of God. There will be a moment in your life that you will need the divine but that divine can only be accessed by faith i pray that that makes sense to you and that's what makes us then begin to to channel all the arsenals that we can access against this weed called doubt because we value faith now we have to target doubt and get a deal with it I pray that it makes you understand why we have to deal with it. Now, you must also understand that always doubt will weaken your faith. The doubt will choke faith. Doubt will always do everything it can to choke your faith. It disables your faith. It disqualifies your faith. But wherever there's doubt, faith does not function. I want you to see that. That is what we see in the Bible. God has warned us. In the book of James chapter number 1, God spoke about this deeply. And in verse number 5 to 8, James speaks this word. He said, if any one of you lacks faith, lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to, to all generously without finding faults. So he says, if you lack wisdom, if you lack wisdom, that's basically saying if you lack anything that can only come from God. If you lack wisdom, then you say it. You must talk to God about it. Ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault. But the next word gives the condition. He says, if you're going to get it, he says, but such a person must believe. And he must not doubt. Because he who doubts is like the wave of the sea tossed back and forth by the waves. And he says, such a person must never to receive anything from the Lord. In other words, he's saying that as long as you have doubt, that doubt will disqualify your faith and will keep you from receiving what you're asking for, which is actually the divine you need. And so the moment you understand that doubt disqualifies your faith, then you want to fight your doubt. You want to make sure that you fight it. Now, doubt causes perishing. That is the information that God's given to us right from the beginning. The book of Genesis 2 and verse number 17, God spoke something very interesting. But number 16, God said this word. He gave the, the fruit trees in the garden, in the center of the garden. And he said, you are free to eat from the tree of life. But verse number 17, God said, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you must not eat of. For when you eat of it, you will surely die. Now, I want you to see that what God is saying here is, you must never eat from the tree of the knowledge of of good and evil. In other words, God never wanted us to be a people who at one point know good and we know evil. Because when you know good and you know evil, then you actually are double. Now, that's the word doubt. But what doubt means to double? It basically means that you actually know good and you also know evil. So you double. And such a person is double-minded. James 1 verse number 8. He says, such is a double-minded man, unstable in all he does. That is what doubt does. Doubt is doubling. And when you look in the scripture, you find it causes perishing. But I want you to see the warning that God gave. God said that the moment you eat from the tree of the knowledge, that the, the significance of that tree is not the food. It's possible that the fruits tasted the same as the fruits you would get from the tree of life. 
It's possible, but the fruits were not even as tasty as some of the fruits in the garden. But the, the central thing about this fruit and this tree is that it is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. In other words, when you're eating it, what you're really looking for is knowledge. That is the principle about it. And so God said, when you eat of it, you will surely die. In other words, the moment you double, the moment you doubt, then you begin to perish. There's no better example in the Bible than the one that we find in the book of Matthew chapter number 14. But number 28 all through 30, we actually find a, a, a scenario where Jesus has, um, has ushered the disciples to go ahead of him. And the disciples are going ahead of him on the Sea of Galilee. They're in a boat. And the scripture says that Jesus went to the mountainside to pray. And then eventually in the night, then Jesus began to follow them up walking on the water. And when the disciples saw Jesus walking on the water, then the thought is a ghost. And they screamed in fear. And the scripture says, Jesus said, take heart, do not be afraid, it is I. And Peter spoke this word, said, Lord, if it is you, tell me to come. Tell me. I want a command from you. I want a word from you. I want instruction from you. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the rhema of God. I want a rhema from you. I want you to release a word to me that will make me have faith so I can walk on the water the way you do it. And Jesus spoke to Peter and he said, come. So Jesus has released to Peter a word. And the scripture say that Peter jumped on that word and he jumped onto the water and he began to walk on the water. And the scripture said that Peter walked on the water. But then suddenly he saw a squall. Peter saw a storm. And when he saw the storm, it's possible that while he's walking, the wind became furious and hit on him. And Peter is somebody that's been a fisherman on the same Sea of Galilee for so many years. So he understands when storm comes, he knows what it means. It's possible that Peter has gone through furious storms before. It's possible that Peter knows people that have been killed by the same storm. And so when he begins to get the gestures and the signals that the storm has come, and the Bible said that when Peter saw the storm, he was afraid and beginning to see, he cried out. Now the thing that I wanted to see is, Peter has information from Christ saying, come. And now suddenly Peter has information from the storm saying, don't ever try. You're going to die. And so, so he is now considering two information. The information that gave him faith and the information that is actually making him now doubt. And in that state of mind, Peter is doubling. He has knowledge of good and evil. And so because of that, therefore, he begins to sink. He begins to perish. And when Jesus reached out to Peter, he rebuked him. He said, you are little faith. Why did you doubt? And in the Greek, why did you double? In other words, why did you think of the word that I spoke come and at the same time think of the word that the storm spoke saying, dare you try? And so in dealing with somebody that has received the weed of doubt, and that then has qualified his faith, and that is why he's perishing, because doubt causes your perishing. I pray that you see it. See, that then is what makes you then begin to think, how then can I get rid of doubt? See, you get rid of it when you understand the significance of faith, and that doubt is a weed that comes to choke the faith that is so important to you. So because of your value for your faith, then you want to actually deal with your doubt. It's just like a farmer. When a farmer has invested in several hundreds of acres of land, and he has invested in seeds, and he has invested in all the things that are required for him to truly get to expect a bumper harvest, and suddenly he has come, he comes, this field and he sees so many weeds that are growing up that are threatening the very crop 
Then you find suddenly he wants to invest to make sure that he gets to deal with the weeds. That's exactly what we're dealing with. The moment you have value for the desired crop, you will actually get to work against the weed. And that is what is happening. So when you value faith, then it's very easy for you to stand up against the weed that is called doubt and fight it. And so this then is how to actually get rid of doubt. The first thing that you got to do is this. You must come to the place where you stop being sin conscious. Now, this is something huge. This is something very huge that is very easy for somebody to misunderstand when you have a, a short slot of time that, that, that you can't be able to explain it. Now, the thing that I want you to see here is the Bible talks about how the law made us sin conscious. And in our sin consciousness, then we always seek to pay for our sin. Let me explain it a different way. If you look at the book of Genesis chapter number, um, number 2, and verse number 7 and verse number 8. The Bible talks about how when God formed the man from the dust of the ground, that God breathed into his nostril the breath of life, the man became a living soul. Now I want you to see the man had divine life. He had divine health. He had everything divine. God had given him divine power, divine authority, everything. And verse number 8, God planted the garden that is called the Garden of Eden. We've talked about that before. I don't want to go back into the depth of it. That was the platform of the divine. And the Bible said that when God planted the garden, that God took the man from the place where God had made him or formed him, and God placed him in the Garden of Eden. In the Garden of Eden, the man had divine purpose. The Bible said, verse number 15, that God placed him there to tend him, to take care of it. God gave him work to do, so every day he wakes up and he does the divine purpose that God Almighty gave to him. So on that platform, there's divine purpose. There on that platform, man has the divine life of God. There on that very platform of the Garden of Eden, the man has divine health. The man has divine wealth. The man has divine power, divine authority. The man has peace that is divine. Everything about him is divine. So the place, the platform of the, 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 the Garden of Eden is the platform of the divine. Now, you understand what made the man lose that contact with the divine. What made the man leave the Garden of Eden and lose the divine is sin. When man sinned, he was driven from the platform of the Garden of Eden, the platform of the divine. So always because of that, we are conscious, always conscious, that what caused us the divine is sin. And so when we want to come back to the divine, there is always this kind of uh, nagging need to pay for sin to qualify for the divine. Uh, a prayer that you get. You realize the scriptures say that God placed in the, uh, at the gate of the Garden of Eden. We've seen this over and over again. That's why I'm rushing through it. Uh, God placed there the, the gate of the garden. God placed a cherub. And God placed a flaming sword flashing back and forth. And God was basically saying, because you've sinned, you can no longer come into contact with the divine. And God was announcing to the man, if you're ever going to come back to the divine, you must pay. The flaming sword demands that you must burn. If you're going to come back there, there must be a burning. But the fl flaming sword is also flashing back and forth. In other words, if you're ever going to try to go past this sword, it's going to cut you, it's going to cause you bleeding, and so you must pay with your blood. Your blood is your life. So God was saying there must be payment. If you're ever going to go back to the divine, you must pay. And because it is sin that causes the divine, we always think of our payment in terms of paying for our sin. So every time that we're reaching out for the divine, the question that nags us very easily is, have I paid for my sin enough to qualify for the divine? So when I'm coming before God to pray, then I'm trying to find out, is there some sin that can keep me from accessing what I'm praying for? Why? Because there's a nagging something in man that always demands for you to actually pay for your sin in order to qualify for the divine. Why? Because what cost us the divine is sin. I pray that you get it. And that in itself then will weaken your faith. 
and will cause doubt. So as long as you're sin conscious, you will always be thinking, how have I lived? And please understand, I'm not trying to say that we should live a compromised life. Please understand, the only thing that I'm trying to make you understand is that God paid for our sin through Christ Jesus. And nothing of your own personal human righteousness can qualify you to access the divine. What makes us have the ability to access the divine is the righteousness of Jesus Christ that God has imputed upon us and that God has given to us as a gift. That is what makes us access the divine. We don't access it because of payment for our own sin. We access it because someone paid for our sin. And so to God, the only currency we must pay with is faith. But as long as you're sin conscious, and as long as you're always nurturing this nagging thought, have I paid for my sin enough to qualify for the divine, then you will always find yourself doubting. Because you will look back to try to find out your record and to find out some of the thoughts that went into your head and find out some of the words that you've got to speak and find out some of the things that probably you did. Even if you've never been in this loud sin, but you look at those small nitty gritties of things and you find yourself disqualified. And so you find you actually trying to pay for your sin before you qualify to ask God for the divine. And that then weakens your faith. So you must understand that sin consciousness has its own ability to weaken your faith. It causes doubt. So you must come to the place where you truly know that you know that you know you are the righteousness of God. You must come to the place where you receive by faith the righteousness that God has given to us through Christ Jesus so that before God Almighty, you know you are blameless, you know you are holy, you know you are righteous, not so much because of what you've done, but because of what Jesus has done. We receive it by faith. In fact, even righteousness is just faith. So you must come to that place. And when you come to that place, then you will come before God boldly. You will come confidently. Why? Because my righteousness that I'm presenting before God is the righteousness that I've received by faith through Christ Jesus. And so I'm not looking at my sins to try to count how many things I did right and how many things I did wrong. I'm looking at what Jesus did. That is what qualifies me to then reach out for the divine by faith before a holy God. I pray that that makes sense. And that will in itself begin to weaken your doubt another factor that is important if you're going to deal with doubt is information watch what information accesses you beloved i don't have the time really to be able to talk to you about this so deeply but i need you to understand what feeds your faith in fact what causes your faith is information the seed of faith is information that's why the Bible said that faith comes by hearing. Faith comes by information. When you receive information, when you hear, is when you receive information. That's how faith comes. So faith comes because of information. But I've got to tell you, doubt also comes because of information. So the moment you're inclined to negative information, you are actually basically building and nurturing doubt. You're giving doubt its power. You're giving doubt a place to destroy you. One of the significant um, portions of scripture in the Bible, so amazing, is found in the book of First Samuel, chapter number 4, where we're talking about verse number 10 all through verse number 19. It actually talks about a time when the Israelites went to war against the Philistines. And... Um, when they went to war against the Philistines, the war turned against them. And the Bible talks about how many, about, about so many Israelites that were actually killed in the battlefield. In fact, 30,000 soldiers fell dead. And among those were the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas. And the scripture says that um, the battle has already turned against Israel. So many thousands have died. 30,000 soldiers have died. The ark has been captured. But as long as Eli does not know, Eli is alive. He's fine. As long as the city does not know, the people are fine. They're cooking their meal. They're getting their line prepared. Everything is fine. But a certain Benjamite young man ran from the battlefield. He came with a video pictures of what he had seen. He had a camera and he captured all the goings on. 
and he came back with such negative information about how overpowered Israel was. He captured the details of the bloodshed and all the 30,000 of the people that have died in the field. He captured the Ark of the Covenant being captured by the Philistines. And he captured all the cry and all the panic and the fear. And he captured the two sons of Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas dead. And he carried the camera and he carried the message, the video, the audio, everything. And he came to the city. And he showed the people the picture. And the Bible said that when he reported this, because of the information, the people began to cry. They were not crying because they're being beaten. They're crying because of the negative information. They're crying helplessly. They're crying in doubt. They're crying overwhelmed. You don't see people crying out to God. You don't see people kneeling down and asking God to move. There are people that are now so helpless, they actually know trouble has come. They're going to be destroyed. And everybody's crying and fleeing as they cry. And the scripture says the whole city was an outcry. And when the same message reached Eli, the Bible said that the moment Eli heard the message, the moment he saw the videos and he saw the pictures and he saw his sons dead, and he saw the Ark of the Covenant captured. And he saw 30,000 soldiers down. And Israel fleeing. And the whole city in uproar and crying. The Bible said that that very moment, very moment, he was shocked. And he fell backwards. And he broke his neck. And he died. This man died not because somebody from the battlefield came with a club and hit his head. He died not because somebody came with an arrow. He died because the negative information robbed him of, of, fee, of faith in God and gave him doubt and made him perish. That's exactly the power of negative information. And the scripture says the wife of Phinehas was actually pregnant, but she was not due. And the moment she saw the video and she heard the news, the Bible said that she went into uh, emergency labor and she was overcome by her labor. And the picture of what I'm talking about these are people who could have actually lived on if they had faith in God. The divine power of God of, of Almighty could have accessed them. But because of the negative information, they got doubt. And that doubt drowned their faith and made them die. So the thing that I wanted to see is that what feeds doubt and makes doubt strong is information. Just like what feeds faith and makes feed faith strong is actually information. One of the things that you must do is you must turn your ears away from negative information. I got to tell you people that have lived worthy of living, people that have lived a life that is worthy are people that have refused to pay to focus on negative information. And even in this season, I want to advise you when I was beginning to talk about this season right from um, several months ago, one of the things that God put in my spirit is that so many people are going to be affected who will not be infected. And God told me that this pandemic is going to affect many people that are not infected. Today, when I listen to news, I hear echoes of many people depressed. They're depressed because they're affected, not infected. They've not been infected by corona, but they're depressed because this affected them. And the reason why they've been affected is because of the information coming from the corona base. When you look at how evil the whole thing is and you see it, it can depress you. And it's all because it brings you not faith, but doubt. Because negative information fuels your doubt. So if you want to get rid of doubt, get rid of the information that feeds it. May God bless you. My name is Kenny Up. I want to pray with you as we close this service right now. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I pray that you will raise a people that are going to walk in faith. Lord, it is clear that we're living at a time when the divine is necessary. We're living at a time when man will have to have contact with the divine power of God. We are surrounded by pandemics and viruses and bacteria like never before. There's never been a generation that had so many outbreaks of diseases that are targeting the same body. My Father, I pray that you will grant us to come to the place where we understand that all of us need the divine power of God. 
that we will reach out for the divine. That we shall be a people that will seek you more than ever before. Reach out to you more than ever before. A people that are going to build faith for the glory of God. I release your blessing upon every life that's been listening. And I pray that your favor comes upon your people in the name of Jesus Christ. I want to pray with you right now who want to give. In our ministry, we never compel anybody to give. That's something that God's put in my spirit right from the beginning of this work. I've never, ever been attracted by emotional compulsion on people to give. God does not bless you when you're compelled by anybody because God loves a cheerful giver. And I do not want to rob you of being blessed of the Lord. So ne never, ever allow yourself to respond to compulsion. Just respond to that nudging in the heart. I love the scripture in the book of Exodus 25, verse number 2. When God has a vision and God wants Moses to build him a tabernacle, God wants a sanctuary to dwell amongst his people, and God says, I have a project that I want you to build for me. But God does not send Moses to go and manipulate everybody to give. He says, receive for me offering from men whose hearts prompt them to give. God does not say receive from everybody. He says receive from men whose hearts prompt them to give. In other words, they love me so much with their hearts, they want to give to me from their heart. And that is the kind of person that God blesses. So when I get to give you this chance to give, beloved, understand that Kenny Upper is not a preacher that will compel you to give. Because then we may benefit as a ministry from your giving, but God may never bless you because you give grudgingly. So I give you this chance, you who want to bless the Lord and you who want to love God. You remember, loving is giving, just as giving is loving. For God so loved the world that he gave. When you love God, you also give. That is the principle. So I want to pray for you right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for everybody that supports this work, our Father. Their hearts are persuaded. Their hearts desire to love you. Dear Father, with their substances, and that's why they do this. Dear Father, I pray that you may bless everybody that gets to send of their tithes and their offerings to this work of our Father. I pray, stretch your hand upon their lives and bless them greatly for the glory of your name. I release your favor and your blessing. Let the heavens be opened over your people. Let your favor come upon them. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. May God continue to build your company. May God continue to empower you. May God make you thrive in a season when many people have become victims. May God raise you and bless you. I want to give you a chance, you who have never given your life to Christ. And for some reason you may not even be sure of, somehow you found yourself listening to me. And somewhere you're beginning to feel a conviction and you know in your heart that you need to give your life to Christ. I want to pray with you right now. So just say this prayer. Say, Lord Jesus, I come to you. I acknowledge that you alone are the Savior of mankind. And I give you my life to save me. I acknowledge that I can't save myself. And so I come to you, Lord Jesus. Save me, deliver me, free me from every trouble of my life, and help me to grow in the kingdom of God. In Jesus' name. If you prayed that prayer, beloved, you've given your life to Christ. May the Lord God bless you so much. We will see you tomorrow in our live Sunday service. I love you very much. Kenny Affer is my name. We've got books. We've got books here that I pray you will reach out for. One of the books, the most powerful books that God's given me grace to write is actually opening your life to accommodate wealth. We trust the Lord that we can be able to open wealth channel and begin to talk to you deeply on wealth building and I pray that God's going to help us. But why don't you begin to own this book so you can be able to explore where we are going as we begin to deal with wealth building. So I pray that God helps you. The latest book that I've written is called um, Living About Man's Offense. We have a copy here. You can be able to order it. We have the numbers there. God bless you as we walk together. Amen, amen, and amen. We'll see you tomorrow. Amen.